while this thing is thinking, let me show you today's lab also. So if you go over to your westillcs.com textbook and click on the data structures textbook, and we are right now knee deep in this unit called architectural concepts. And we are going to be talking about this factory methods design pattern right here. And this lab is the alien creation lab that actually it follows today's assignment, but it's strangely not related to today's assignment. It's actually related to Friday's assignment. This is the starting point for Friday. So we're going to do this lab before Friday, basically. That's the idea. But we have to cover this static factory methods first. This channel over here, by the way, I forget what the name of it is. Uh, let's just have a quick look. This is another great channel on YouTube. There's so many great channels on YouTube now. Uh, I, I wish these had been around when I was your age in terms of a learning environment. It's just fantastic. Uh, this is called uh, D D DGU. I don't know what that stands for, but this is a great programming channel also. Okay. So let's hopefully, uh, this thing has woken up here. And we're going to, no, it has not woken up. Okay. Uh, I'm going to start a brand new project. And I'm going to call it uh, static. And here's my project. And I'm going to go over to the source directory. And I'm going to create a new class called coordinate. So we're going to create this Java class called coordinate. And we're going to create a xy coordinate system and this one we're going to use decimal numbers so i'm going to go uh, double x and double y now it turns out that if we were to store coordinates this is one of the two ways that you have learned in math class to store coordinates this one you probably learned in either pre-algebra or algebra these are what are known as cartesian coordinates but there's another option for storing coordinates the, the one that you don't like, uh, you never liked it, but it's just as valid as this one. Uh, Mr. Ben, what is that? Polar. It's polar. So if we were to do polar, uh, we would not store X and Y. What are the two things we would store here, Miss Mila? So we would store R and we would store um, oops, uh, double uh, theta. Uh, and theta would typically be stored in what format in terms of uh, units? Who can tell me? Yes, Miss Mila? Uh, usually not. Yes, sir. We would typically store it in radians. So I want you to imagine a coordinate system where sometimes we're going to use this and sometimes we're going to use that. And so I want to propose to you, first of all, a couple of different ideas for how we might construct this class. I forgot, by the way, these should say, um, <clears throat> well, we could make them private, and we typically would. But in this case, we're actually going to make it so that they don't ever change. In other words, we're going to make it so that once you set the coordinate, it, it can't be changed. So what word would we use here to make it so that, Mr. Basu, can you tell me, sir? Final. So we're going to do a final here. And so, and my first question is, we have a design decision to make. We can either keep track of the X, the Y, the R, and the theta, or, or we could keep track of one of these sets and then calculate the other one whenever we need it. And what I'd like to know is, what, is one of those approaches going to be better or worse? I would like you to discuss this with the person next to you, and then I would like to hear your thoughts on whether it would be better to keep track of all four entities here or to just keep track of two and then calculate the other two when we need them. Yes, Ben? Mr. Scholson, sir, I would like to hear your thoughts on this matter. Do you think it would be better to keep all four entities or to keep just one pair and then calculate the other one whenever we need it? That would be your, your gut reaction. And in this case, it might get, you might get away with it because these are final. Uh, does anybody have a different opinion? Ms. Mila, what's your thought? Okay, so Ms. Mila suggests that we keep this one, which is more near dear to you, and we calculate R and theta whenever we need them. And furthermore, she says that uh, there's a chance that if we were to change X or Y, which we wouldn't do here, but in some other models we might, that the R and theta might fall out of sync and that we may not be able to uh, figure that out. So I'm going to explain something really important. You need to know this for the rest of your computing life. 
There can only be one truth in a system. Do not duplicate data in your state variables. Do not do it. You're going to run into trouble as the class gets more complicated. They're going to fall out of sync with one another. And the worst part is you won't even know that they're out of sync. Do not keep an extra copy of the data lying around in some other form. Go through the process of recalculating it every time you need it. Can someone do something with the board up there? Like maybe touch it or something? OK, thank you. There can only be one truth in a system. And even though it's slightly slower to have to recalculate each time you need it, it is 10 times safer and better programming practice to only have one copy of the data in the system at only one time. So now that becomes a question, how do we calculate x and y from r and theta back and forth? Does anybody remember what the formula are for calculating x and y from r and theta? I would like to hear from someone else, but thank you for the two of you. Mr. Mulcahy, sir. Sir, I know it's been a long time. It was probably honors pre-calculus, I'm guessing, but I'm not exactly sure where you learned polar since I haven't been a math teacher for several years. Sir, can you tell me what is the formula for X? Okay, sir. X equals, does that ring any bells? Not yet? Okay, how about something times something? R times something, R times, there's no Y on the other side because we're using R and theta. Any, anybody remember? Mr. Franvik, do you remember, sir? Mr. Orspive, do you remember? Okay, it's R times cosine of theta. And does anybody remember, this is a comment I'm putting in, I'm not actually coding right now. And does anybody remember, what about the Y value? Anybody remember the Y value? It's similar. Okay, Miss Mila. It's R times sine theta. So that's just a little reminder, a little refresher. So what we want to do now is we want to give the user the flexibility to create our coordinates using either technique, either technique. So we're going to create two constructors. Now, I'm going to create them using comments for a second, and we'll see why that is. And then I, we want to have a little discussion about these constructors. So the first constructor we're going to make is it's going to be public coordinate double x and double y. And then we're going to say here this dot x equals x and this dot y equals y. And we'll finish off the first constructor like that. And that one's fairly straightforward. And then we're going to have another constructor. It's going to go public coordinate. And we're going to say double R and double theta. And this one, we're going to say this dot X equals, and then we're going to take our formula, R cosine theta. You may have to import this function. I don't remember if it automatically comes in or not, but we'll figure that out later. And r dot sine theta. I probably need to do like a math dot something like that, I'm guessing. I don't really remember, but something like that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That was actually the point of my lesson today. So Ben actually is pointing out that the signatures are the same. And I say, anything wrong with that? Mr. Ajoji, sir, if I were to take these comments off, would these would these uh, constructors compile? Sir, can you tell me why? Okay, in Java, you cannot have two methods with the same signature. You also cannot have two constructors with the same signature. Technically speaking, constructors aren't even methods because they don't have return values. But in any case, you can't have two of them that have exactly the same signature. This signature of this constructor is called coordinate double double and this one is also coordinate double double so now if i was to take the comments off you can see here that it says that it's already defined so that's not going to work does anybody have any other ideas for what we might be able to do 
to solve this problem because clearly we want the user to be able to create these coordinates using either strategy. Yes, Ben. Okay, we could do that. We could create a single constructor and we could do it like this and we could say uh, Boolean is polar like that. But now these variables are coming in with different types, uh, with, with different uh, meanings, even though we're using the same variables. And this is considered awkward, but it's certainly a, a plausible alternative. Uh, we could also do this. We could put in a dummy argument here like this, just that it won't be used, but when we call it, we'll be able to differentiate between the constructors. This is also awkward, you agree? Also awkward. So it turns out that there is no real good solution to this problem because of the limitations of Java. So one of the ways that designers get around this is by using something called a static factory method. And I'm going to show you that now. So in order to use a static factory method, we're going to only have one constructor, and that's going to be this one. We could have also used this one, by the way, but I'm guessing this one is probably just easier for you to deal with. Uh, so we're going to do that. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how the factory methods are made. So we're going to create two factory methods. And in order to give them good names that are extremely descriptive, that describe what they do, we're going to call the first one from XY. And the other one we're going to call from polar. So I'm going to say uh, this thing is going to return a coordinate. And it's going to be called uh, from xy. And it's going to take double x and double y as variables. And I think Ben had suggested that we make these capitalized since they're final. And I like that idea. And uh, I should change them here too then. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, over here, I'm going to call this constructor right here. I'm going to say return coordinate x, y, like that. Right? I forgot the keyword new here. I need that also. All right, so what's happening now is I have this method. It's kind of weird looking. I'm going to basically, inside this method, I'm going to create a coordinate. And I'm going to return it. So this is sort of acting like, sort of like what a constructor acts like, except that it's got a return value. It's got a descriptive name on it, et cetera. And now I'm going to create another one of these to do the polar version. I'd like you to work with your partner to do that one for me. So I'd like you to do coordinate from polar, uh, uh, double R and double theta. And now I would like you to write the body of that function for me. Yes, Ben? Is there a reason the accessor is default and not public? Um, we could make it public, sir. Uh, what, what ends up happening is as your skills as a programmer continue to grow, you're going to get a little bit lazier, and most people here would just kind of leave it as default, but it is perfectly okay to declare them as public here. Perfectly okay. So Ben is asking why I didn't put public here, and it will be perfectly fine to do so uh, just out of laziness. Uh, here? Yep. Uh, what did you want to do? Like, why is it uh, default coordinate instead of public coordinate from XY? Sir, I'm not following you now. On line 13, it's coordinate from XY. Yeah. Parameters. Yeah. So is there oh, oh, the return type. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I, I'm actually haven't um, uh, finished that. I'm, I'm gonna, I've got a few extra. It's not just going to be public. It's going to be a bunch of other things also. But it is going to be public. I see what you're saying. Yes, it, it is. I haven't finished uh, declaring the headers for these methods yet. Go go ahead and uh, finish this one for me. Work with your partner. I, I know this is the last thing you expected to do in my class today, but here you are. Okay, so there you go. Now, as Ben was saying, we still have some cleanup work to do with some of the keywords here. We have to declare 
whether these methods should be public, private, or some other thing, what would be best? I think Ben already gave us the answer. What was Ben? What, do you, what did you say was best here? P public. We're going to be going to use public. Yes, that, I think that was your suggestion, right? Okay. Now we have another weird situation. In order to create a coordinate, we have to have a coordinate because we have to call this method on some coordinate, but we don't want it like that. We want to be able to call this method without having any coordinates already created. What kind of methods should these be, Mr. Ajoji? They need to be static methods. And finally, and this is a subtlety that I haven't taught you yet, we don't want anybody messing with these units, with these methods. We don't want anybody messing with these methods because these are going to sub be substitute constructors for us. Substitute constructors. So any class that derives from this, we don't want them changing these, these pseudo constructors. How can I tell the compiler not to allow anyone to override these methods? Yes, sir. Very good, sir. Now you won't be able to override the methods. We've never used final on a method before, I don't think, in this class. But here's an example. We're going to make it so that you can't you can't override these methods. These are these are sort of quasi constructors now. And now we have a couple of other problems to solve. The first problem is that when someone is using our class, they're not going to know to use these things, right? What are they going to use? The constructor, and the constructor is limited because you can't construct anything with R and theta. So we need to find some way to force the user to not use the constructor and to use these methods instead. Is there some way we can turn off this con coordinate constructor to the user and only make it available to us? Mr. Afsari, you have an idea, sir? I'm sorry? Yes, sir. Now, this is another trick we've never seen before. We're actually going to make the constructor private. Now that's kind of wild, right? You have a class and the constructor is private. No one's allowed to make them. And the reason why is that you want to, to, to divert the user to using these constructors or pseudo constructors instead. Yes, Ben? Would it be correct to use protected as well or only private? I think we really want to use private here because even if we have a class that inherits from this class, we don't really want them to mess with the way that we're creating these objects. And so I think private is the right designation here. Let me just see if I've forgotten anything. I think that's basically it. So this is uh, a technique that can be used. And I want to leave off today by telling you that this technique of using these static factory methods, because that's what these are called. These are static factory methods. This is a controversial technique. I've shown you some of the good things about it. Let's discuss what are some of the good things about this approach. What do you notice about the names of the methods versus the name of the constructor? Miss Olivia, what do you notice about the names here? Do you like the names or are they better than just having a constructor name or worse? What do you think? The names are really descriptive. So that's one of the things people like about static factory methods. One of the things that people don't like about them is that they're static. And static methods are extremely controversial in Java because they're like global methods. And the whole idea behind Java is not to have a lot of global stuff lying around. But here we've gone out of our way to, to turn off the constructor and instead provide these global methods that can be accessed from anywhere. That's the trade-off. If you're ever at a job interview, and they ask you your opinion of things like a static method, it's a trap, okay? You don't know what religion that interviewer comes from or belongs to. So what you need to do is you need to phrase your answer in such a way to suggest that you, at least as it comes to coding, don't have a religion, that you're willing to accept whatever that institution does or thinks in terms of their own philosophy. Now, they may not let you get away with that. They may put a gun to your head and just force you to, to tell them exactly how you feel about static methods, in which case you might have to. But try to walk the middle ground for as long as you can in that job interview. 
In CSA, we didn't really cover any controversial topics. We gave you the basics of Java and the, the stuff that you needed for your CSA exam. As we start to learn more and more sophisticated topics in this course, you'll see that not everyone is going to be in love with the idea of using them. They're going to be controversial topics, and this is the first controversial topic that we've come across in our learning for, for, for data structures. So this basically gives you a nutshell of how to create static factory methods. We're now going to go over and discuss an unrelated topic. Does anybody have any questions about static factory methods? On Friday, there will be a brief quiz on static factory methods. I'm going to ask you to create another class from scratch that's going to be similar to this. And you need to understand that you need to make these final and that these static and that you need to turn off the traditional constructor. These are the things that you're going to need to show me on the quiz on Friday. Anybody have any questions? OK, so that's a very brief lesson for today. And it was meant to be brief. Let me just save and exit. And now we're going to look back at our lab here. And this lab is not really so much related to what we were just discussing, but this is a precursor to Friday's lesson. And so what I need you to do here is walk through this and build this little alien factory. Uh, what we're doing here is we have an alien class and we have these different types of aliens, uh, squid alien, monkey alien, tiger alien, and rat alien. And what we want to do is we want to create a random one of those, a random one. So you're going to need to use the math.random method. I know it's been a while since you've looked at that. And you're going to need to ch use that method to generate a number between 0 and 3, integer inclusive, and then use that random number to decide what kind of alien you're going to have in your game. And you need to create a whole bunch of those random aliens and put them in an, either an array or an array list. I forget what they asked for. We're going to go next door and we're going to start this lab. If you don't finish this lab, you have to finish it for homework tonight or tomorrow night. Because when you come in on Friday, this is the starting point for our lesson. So this lab has to be complete by then. Let's go next door and press the buttons.